All right, if everybody find their place, please, we're going to get started tonight. We want to say welcome to you that have tuned in via the internet, and uh, we trust that you've come to get a blessing. I trust that you've been praying for our services tonight, but we're glad to have you, glad to see our people here as well, and our visitors with us tonight. We're always appreciative of that. You could have gone to a lot of places, but you chose to be here with us. So Brother Jason's going to lead us uh, in a couple of songs, and then I'll have some announcements, and then we're going to have some special music, okay? All right, Brother Jason, come on. All right, good evening. Let's take our hymnals, turn to hymn 597. Hymn 597. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my
Amen. Thank you, Brother Jason, for those good songs. Appreciate you being here tonight. Just by way of announcements, Brother Dean, you and your family can get ready to come on up. We're going to have some special music from them and then the opening of the Word of God. But just by way of announcements, I want to remind you about something. Next Sunday is God and Country Day. <clears throat> the 4th of July, of course, we know falls on the 4th, but on the 5th of July, we want to recognize that and uh, celebrate that. Amen. In our nation, we, we're not only Christians, but we're patriots. Amen. I thank God that I live in America, born in America, and, uh, and that uh, we just enjoy some blessings as no other nation has on the planet being here. And so uh, I trust that you'll come out for that, 11 a.m. That'll be the only service that we're going to have that, that day. There'll be no evening service and no fellowship that night. And also, we, uh, we've talked to Brother Dwayne. We feel it's best right now. They feel like they would just like to suspend the midweek the Wednesday night classes for the young people. So if you were planning to attend, we'd like you to come in here. We're still going to have services like regular Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And so please be praying about that. We're continuing to teach on the home, strengthening our home. And, uh, and we're getting close to the end, men, of where we're dealing with you. And we'll be starting in on how to help the ladies pretty quick. So ladies, I don't want you to be absent during those meetings now, amen. Don't find something else to do like leftover sewing or whatever or crocheting and, and the like that you just had to get done on that Wednesday. So we want you to be sure and be in attendance, okay. So, uh, but anyway, those are the things that, uh, that we're looking at and uh, please continue to pray for Miss Oliver. She was able to come home from the hospital and so uh, we covet your prayers for her, amen, that she'd make the adjustments and stay well and the like and continue to pray for Brother Roger and Miss Cindy and others in our assembly, some that are out and, and the like. And so, boy, we need that. We need to pray one for another, amen, and hold each other up. And uh, we thank God for you and glad that you're here tonight and glad for those that have tuned in. So, Brother Dean, you, uh, you all go ahead, amen.
Amen. Thank you, Brother Dean. That is true, boy. Thank God he paid the ransom. Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles tonight, I'd like you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> I want to be a blessing to you, an encouragement to you. And just put you in remembrance of some things, you know, in the light of these days and so forth. And, and uh, that... Sometimes, you know, one of the things that the enemy tries to do, I believe, one of those things is just the, the power of the devil lies in his power to deceive. And one of those things sometimes is to make you feel like you're all alone, sometimes in your struggle and in your battle. And, and beloved, that's the furthest thing from the truth. And, uh, and I want to remind you about some of those things tonight, if I can, with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so let's read these passages, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, familiar verses of Scripture. And uh, beginning in verse 3, and it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual to the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye, also, so shall ye be also of the consolation. And I just want to remind you tonight about the, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort that is ours to enjoy. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Father, thank you for the good singing tonight, the special Lord. Thank you for the great and terrible price that was paid that we might have life, Lord, through the cross of Calvary, the finished work of Jesus Christ that he did in our stead. I thank you, Lord, that he was delivered for my offenses and raised for my justification and that now is seated at your right hand and ever liveth to make intercession for us. I thank you for these dear folks, Lord, that have gathered tonight and those listening at home. And I pray, Father, that your word might have free course, that it would be honored and glorified tonight and that we would mix faith with what we hear, that the preached word may be profitable unto us. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, probably you recall David once reported in Psalm 142, and I know that probably you, you probably don't have that particular psalm quoting in your mind right now, but he did say in verse 4, he said, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. David said, man, I don't even have anybody out here who will identify themselves with me. And he said, refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. <clears throat> and I want to say to you tonight, beloved, that, that it may seem that way. It may appear that way from time to time in your life that I'm all alone in this struggle or battle or whatever you might be facing, whether it be work, physical, financial or whatever. I want you to know that you are not alone tonight. And just as Paul reported here, he said, blessed be God, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And so that word comfort there literally means to come alongside. Brother, we got just a little bit of ringing in the volume here. If you can turn that down just a little bit, all right? And so I want you to see, first of all tonight, and just some, just some simple thoughts here for you. I want you to see tonight the sources of our comfort. Look in verse 3 with me. And notice what it says. It says, even the Father. Now, the triune God, and I don't, I don't say that by mistake. You understand what I mean when I say by triune. Triune is that trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together, three in one. Amen. But each person of the trinity has a role in our comfort. Each person does. The first one being the Father. You know, the Father, when we think about him, that is his relational name to us. And uh, as is, uh, that is reminded again in 1 Thessalonians, 
where Paul talks about how he charged them like a father, how he comforted them like a father, how he exhorted them like a father. And you know, sometimes when you've had trouble, there's, there's nothing quite like getting that reassurance from that steady hand from the person that you looked up to in your own home being your dad. Someone who could set things aright. And I know I've used this illustration before, but it just seems fitting here. It comes to my mind. It's about that little girl whose father was a sea captain. He sailed back and forth between England and America on those fast sailing schooners. And she begged him and begged him each time he made the trip, please let me ride, please let me ride. And he always said no. And finally, after much, uh, after much if you will, importunity, much pestering, she, he finally relented and said, okay, you can go on this trip. And sure enough, they got out there in the middle of the North Atlantic and there was a bad, bad storm. And, uh, and she was in the bottom of the ship and she awakened in the middle of the night to screams. And there were the, there were the stewards and purser of the ship trying to get the, the, uh, the passengers to settle back down, to get back in their berth. And it said that this little girl just came up to him about 10 years old, tugged on his waistcoat and said, is my father on the deck? And he looked down at her and he said, yes, lass, he is. And he said, with that, she just smartly turned right around, walked back to her bunk, got in there and was soon fast asleep because she knew as long as her daddy was on the deck, she was going to be all right. And beloved, we have a father in heaven who thinks about us as being his children, who looks down upon us and has pity upon us. He remembers us. He remembers our frame it is but dust. And so we're not alone in the struggles that we face, in the hardships that may or may not come to pass, or whatever your imagine can, can, imagination can put together. Our God is still on the throne. Our Father is still in the business of comforting His children. Paul knew that. He believed that. He trusted in that. As a matter of fact, he testified to it. Look in verse 4. It says, "...who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that, why? that we may be able to comfort them..." which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. As, God. as God comforted Paul in all his trials and tribulations, he was then able to testify and witness to others about the comforting hand of God in his life so as to be an encouragement to those who were going through a struggle. And so adversity comes our way to broaden our usefulness. It gives God an opportunity for Him to, if you will, to show His faithfulness in our lives that your faith and my faith might increase. And so sometimes, you know, but the devil's not going to remind you about all that. Maybe when the struggle comes or the trial comes or the difficulty comes. He doesn't do that. But I want to remind you tonight, it's what God put on my heart tonight to assure you that our Heavenly Father is still on the throne and is acquainted with our circumstances. Listen, if He keeps track of a sparrow, if He knows the number of hairs on your head, He knows all about your situation because there's, there's nothing hidden from Him. And so the Father has something to do that. And you know what people do. You know how people try to resolve their problem. I mean, a lot of folks do a lot of different things. You know, some people, uh, some people self-medicate. That's how they handle their problems. It's a form of escape because they can't cope with life. Some people sleep all the time. They, they think that they are just parentally uh, tired and, and so forth. That's what people who are depressed do because once you're asleep, you don't have to think about this present world. You get away from it for a little bit. Other people People, you know, practice that mall therapy. You know what I'm talking about? They go out and buy stuff. And, uh, and they feel like because if I shop and I get something, it's going to take my mind off my problem. And it doesn't. The problem hasn't gone away. You, you just bought something that maybe you didn't need, that you couldn't afford, that you thought was going to make you feel better. And 24 hours later, you got regrets that you bought it. Or it rips or tears or breaks, and you're greatly disappointed. There's all kinds of things that people do. But our Father is on the throne and His relationship with us is secure. His relationship with us is, if you will, I, I, I'm telling you, it can't be mined away. It can't be detracted or reduced. It is part of that unspeakable gift that we got on the day that we got saved. We became His child. He became our Father. And then He becomes responsible for our existence and for our means and our support. And what a blessing that is. It's no wonder that Paul said, Blessed be God because he had received those things many, many times during the course of his life.
Not only the Father is involved, but Christ is involved. Notice how he puts this. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Son of God has all the qualifications and credentials, if you will, to qualify Him to be able to render aid. I want you to go to the book of Hebrews with me. Look in chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Keep your place there in 2 Corinthians, but look in Hebrews chapter 2 with me. Notice what it says about Him. I'm turning there. I appreciate you turning. Hebrews chapter 2. Look in verse 17. It says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in, in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Listen, he, he, has, he has a complete comprehension of the human experience. Prior to that, he didn't have that. You know, oftentimes we just think about Jesus strictly, you know, we, we, we consider him the, the God man, right? When we, we sort of preface it 100% God while all the while being 100% human. And, and the things that he did, the deeds that he did, walking on the water, raising the dead. Like Nicodemus, we say, man, no man could do this except God be with him, right? I mean, that wasn't what the average person was doing in Jerusalem in those days. We read the miracles, how he calmed the seas and so forth. And the things that, the things that he did, knowing the hearts of men and knowing their thoughts and being able to read those things and seeing clearly like no other man could. We attribute most of those things to his, to his God side, if you will, and we forget about oftentimes the human side. Beloved, he knew what it was like to be thirsty. He knew what it was like to be hungry. Remember he said, man, the, foxes, the, the, fo the birds have nests and the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. I mean, he even knew what it was like, if you will, and we'll use the word to be homeless. He knew what that was like. He knew what it was like to be betrayed. He knew what it was like for people just to, uh, if you will, to use him or to feign their appreciation. Some folks only came around him just because of the miracles that he did. It wasn't because they were really committed to him, but because they really loved him, because they really trusted him. He endured all those things. You know, I read this morning such contradiction of sinners. I mean, he knew what it was like to be hated. He knew what it was like to be misunderstood, even by his own family. You would think, you know, a lot of times of all people that would be supportive or that would understand you and your walk would be your family. But a lot of times they weren't. I mean, they just thought that he was oftentimes just beside himself. You remember? Remember when he was in that, in, that, in that building and they were outside and there was a big crowd there and somebody said, hey, hey, your family's out there, let's make way for them. And, and, and who did Jesus say, man? He, Jesus said, well, who really is my family? And he said, it was he that doeth the will of God. That really is my family. He wasn't making any special considerations for them. But he knew what it was like. And so the human experience, beloved, I mean, you know, his will versus the will of God. He battled with those things just like how we do. That's why I said he, he is completely comprehending of the human experience and did what? Unlike us, he triumphed in every situation. Man, just think about it. Never had a, never had a wrong thought. N never had a wrong intention. Never had a wrong word come out of his mouth. I mean, you remember what Luke said about him when they heard him in the temple? They said, man, who is this guy? I mean, he had gracious words. Unlike a lot of us sometimes. In his humanity, he did these things. That's why, you know, Matthew presents him as the king of kings. Mark is that servant. Luke is, he's the son of man. He is our example. You know, those Greeks, they had their idea. They had their idea of what the perfect man was. You know, he was all buff and, you know, he was a, an athlete and he did all these things and so forth, but he didn't have a relationship with God. 
And Jesus in the book of Luke presents himself as the Son of Man. This is how the right, this is how a righteous man deals in his daily life. And these are the things that he's going to endure. And this is how he handles those problems. But now look, you're in chapter 2 of Hebrews. Look in chapter 4 with me. Just turn right. Just a couple chapters. Look at verse 15. 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is in passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but what is but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He understood the human condition. You say, well, man, you know, I, I, I'm adopted and, or, or I, I don't know... Well, who do you think Joseph was? That was his stepfather. I mean, if you want to call it, I mean, he even knew what it was like to be part of a blended family. Well acquainted with those things. Really, he was a man of sorrows, was he not? And acquainted with grief. And he endured all those things so that he could render aid to me and you. That's why when we go to a man, I'm not, I'm, listen, we don't bow before some statue, some little fat bellied guy, or, or some image of a woman, or, or some other creature or thing out there. We don't do that. They don't have any feeling, they don't know what it's like, the human experience. But our blessed Savior does. He does. And He is reliable. You know, again, I just think we comprehend better the God side of things than not so much the human side. And you think about it, He even knows what it means to look outside of Himself to get help. Remember, I mean, man, look at the number of times that the Lord Jesus prayed. Whether it be for instruction, whether it be for power, whether it be for enlightenment, he had to have those things. I mean, even being alone, I mean, that night that he, before he was crucified, he had to have some grace, beloved. And, and, one of the, and, and in his example, who ministered to him? It was angels. And do you know what? That you and I have angels assigned to us as children of God that intend to minister to us the things that we need. You know, people talk, I don't have any problem believing that. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. That's why you and I, beloved, we're to walk by faith and not by sight. To me, this is real. This is the reality. I mean, have you ever wondered how in the world have you made it thus far? I, I, I'm, I'll be, Lord willing, I'll be 68 years old uh, in a few months. And, uh, man, I wonder how in the world have I made it this far? I was 28 when I got saved, and in those 40 years, I, how in the world have I made it? All you can say, man, is just the grace of God. How did Paul make it through all those things, a day and night in the deep, and all the things he suffered as a missionary? Just the grace of God. The grace of God. The Father has His relationship with us. The Son has that role as our great high priest and intercessor. And He intercedes for us. And then, of course, there's the Holy Spirit. What is His name? He's called the Comforter. The Comforter who lives inside of us, who can breathe that peace to your heart. You, you get in the prayer closet and you're troubled or you got a struggle and He comes along and speaks peace to your heart as you've poured out your complaint or you've confessed your, your sin, if you will, uh, your misdeed or whatever thought or deed or omission or commission and He can speak peace to your heart. And give you what you need. You know, the name comforter there means paraclete, the one who comes alongside to render aid in my time of trouble. Well, listen, when I've prayed over a loved one, have you ever had a loved one sick and I've prayed over it and I've seen God do some things and bring relief? Just the Spirit of God. 
You get in a service, man, who is it that warms your heart when you've been down and out and you come to the house of God and the singing gets on and the preaching's on? What is that that fills your heart with those things? And it overjoys, that's the Holy Ghost of God doing His work as comforter. And it doesn't only happen here. It can happen on the job. Man, I... I and I remember we were doing sheetrock and we were both up on stilts and we were, we were uh, taping and floating in this house. We was up on the second story and man, uh, we, were, we were listening to some music and it was that song, Calvary Covers It All. I know that Brother Jason leads us in that. I, I wanted to sing that as a special one time with Brother David Waller and, and another. And uh, because man, that just has such a great, just a great message to it. It, it would be a great special. Somebody needs to sing it. Amen. But Calvary covers it all. And, I, I, and man, we were up there and me and Brother Wade Biggs, we were doing that work and we'd been sweating and working. And man, that song came on and it just, it came on and then it came on us. And we just got the can't help it. And man, we were shouting, carrying on. And I got a tray. I got a pan of mud in one hand and a, and a six inch uh, putty knife over here. And, uh, and I, man, we're hollering, it's the blood. It's the, I mean, we were just shouting her out, rejoicing. And what we had, and then, then we, we happened to look out the window, man, there was a bunch of workmen out in the front yard, and I, we thought to ourselves, oh my gosh, well, I wonder what they think we're talking about up here. It's the blood shouting at the top of our lungs. Hey, we were just having a moment. God was encouraging us right then and there. Probably I could take some testimonies tonight of people who have been in different places and where the Lord came along and spoke to your heart and said, it's going to be all right. It's going to be well. I hope that's your case, that God knows where I live and knows what I need and what word needs to be spoken, whether it be financial or physical or family problems or whatever it might be. God knows how to cut through all that veneer and get to the heart of the matter and give me what I need. And the Holy Spirit does that. that listen to this. In the midst of their trouble, there in Acts chapter 9, listen to this. It said, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. It doesn't mean that God takes away the trouble. It just means that He gives you what you need in the midst of the trouble. Just like those men, they didn't pray, God, would you remove all these Pharisees and Sadducees that hate us and hated the Lord and crucified Him. They didn't say, God, remove all these wicked men. They just said, Lord, give us boldness. And beloved, that ought to be our prayer today. God, just give us what we need for the hour. Not necessarily to remove the problem, but God, give me what I need to sustain me. And I'm telling you that grace, that divine enabler is there because He has it all. God has the monopoly on this matter of comfort and even mercy. So what is the scope of it? What are the parameters of it? Go back with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians and look with me here. What are the parameters? When I say parameters, what, what are the, if you will, what are the boundaries of these things? Notice what he says. Look in, look in verse 3. It says, the Father of mercies. On one side is mercy, on the other side is comfort. Those are the parameters like parentheses. On one side of my situation is mercy, on the other side of my situation is comfort. And He is God over both of those and everything in between. How does he do it? You know, sometimes in his mercy, I mean, it might be, you know, and what, what do we know mercy to be? It's when God holds back, God restrains from giving us what we really deserve. That's why David wrote in Psalm 103 and he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget what? And forget not all his benefits. And then he lists a bunch of things, who healeth and who forgiveth and all the things that God does instead of bringing judgment upon our lives. He said he hath not dealt with us after our iniquities. Listen, he could have, when we prayed and asked for forgiveness on that day when we got saved, he could have said no. He didn't have to. You understand, being, being saved is a privilege. God dealing with your heart, I mean, I, 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 probably, probably there are people in here that you didn't get saved the very first time that God dealt with your heart. 
And what I mean by that is that he didn't have to knock a second time. He could have just knocked once and met the requirement, if you will. But he didn't. He was long-suffering. That's what Peter said, count the... The, count the salvation, the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. Look how many times maybe He dealt with your heart. That wasn't the first time when I was 28 that God dealt with my heart that I went forward that day. He'd been dealing with me for a while. And some of you are in the same boat, some of you are in the same condition. And the Lord just kept knocking on the door of your heart and said, Come unto me, come unto me. Come on, come unto me. I love you, come unto me. And you finally raised the white flag of surrender. He was so long suffering. In that, God, the scripture says, who is rich in mercy. That's what Ephesians 2 and 4 says. But God. You know that passage there, he's talking about what we were. We were shirt, we were doomed, we were under the, we were sensual, under the, under the, if you will, the power of the devil. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And then there is that but. Whatever men say but, usually that's unbelief. Oh, we want to do this. Well, but we've never done it that way before. Uh, but, but what about this? I mean, that, that usually that's when men say but, they have to deal with unbelief. But it seems like, but God, when He uses the word but, it's when He butts in. And man, there's plenty of mercy to go around. But God, who is rich in mercy, and He is. On one side is mercy. Now, what form could that be? In that comfort, it could be in the form of grace, which I've already mentioned, that divine enabler that helps you through some things. It could be in the form of peace that he gives you in the midst of your struggle. And you know, sometimes we've watched some of you, and I've said this before, I'm not losing my mind when I repeat some things, but sometimes they are for emphasis. We forget this. Maybe you and I have watched other people in our assembly that have struggled with things, whether it be illness, and maybe even those illnesses wound up being terminal. We watched their loved ones who handled themselves with dignity and with grace and with hope. Now, who doesn't? We've also watched other people outside the family of God when they have had those kind of struggles and they don't have anyone, they don't have anyone to turn to and often they're left to themselves. And they're hopeless. And their joy is gone. And even, if you will, the things that they think make up their life, the thing that they were holding on to, and it's gone but not for the child of God. And we watch some of you struggle through things, difficulties, and yet we just see the grace of God. And maybe you're not even aware of it that brought you through it, but but we see it and we rejoice in it. We thank God when it's our turn, amen, to be in that valley, that there'll be grace for us. And I suspect that there will be grace for us. You know why? Because God's no respecter of persons. Man, we're his children, and he loves you like you were, like that songwriter said, he loves me like I was his only child. Amen. And it's so. It might be in the form of grace. It might be in the form of peace. It might be in, comfort might come even in the form of assurance that I know your circumstance, and I'm going to take care of that situation. A confidence, a quiet confidence that strengthens you in the midst of difficulties and maybe even confusion around you. You know, black folks used to, they, they, they had a song and they used to say, uh, it said, he may not be there when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. <laughs> I can't sing it. I won't try to do it like how they did, but I believe it. Amen. I mean, that's exactly how he is. It may not be there when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. And you look at the places where in the, in the book of Mark where suddenly this happened, immediately that happened. I mean, those words were used in there specifically because it was a time of action. And sometimes, you know, when God does a certain thing, sometimes it can, be, it can go on for a long stretch, and then sometimes He does things suddenly. But it's all in His timing. And it's all done for our benefit and for our profit. And that's what you have to keep in mind. And you think about it, man, comfort sometimes even can come from the saints of God. You believe that? Sometimes your brothers and sisters will have that word for you. Just when you needed it most. 
That's the hand of God, beloved, at work, sending someone along in your path that has a word for you. Maybe sometimes it's just a phone call said, man, I'm, I'm praying for you. I, I had a, a Miss Barlow. She's gone home to be with the Lord, and uh, she and her husband used to have a florist shop there in Macomb, Mississippi. And, uh, and John, she would tell me John R. Rice, would, when he would pass through, would stay in their front room, and he would write part of the sword of the Lord and do some of his articles there. And she knew all about the situation we were in up there in that campground up in Summit. And uh, she would call me sometimes and just sing me a song. <laughs> Just to try to encourage me, I'm praying for you, Brother Ed. You're up there at the camp, and I know you are, and we just want you to know I love you, and I'm praying for you, brother. And hang up. Miss Barlow, she had an old, she had an old Nova, 1966 Nova station wagon. Man, that, I'd like to have that thing. And, uh, and Miss Barlow with her orthopedic shoes and her hair in her bun, Christy knows who I'm talking about, dresses all the way up to here and all the way down to there. And uh, I would ask her, I said, Miss Barlow, do you want me to back you out? She said, oh no. And she popped out of the car and she dropped around there and she pointed the back bumper and on there was a bumper sticker that said, Jesus is in control. <laughs> I hope. Amen. But, uh, but Miss Barlow, but I mean, she would just be a blessing and God would send her along at the right time. And sometimes she might say, Brother Ed, I've got $100 here for you. I've been saving it up. The Lord told me to give it to you. That'd be a blessing. Can you, can you recall? I hope it's not so far back in your memory. Can you recall times that God has used the saints to be a comfort to you? Beloved, that's the hand of God. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Certainly, man, we have the scriptures. Amen. Hasn't the Word of God been a comfort and a, I mean really, a shelter in a time of storm that you could read something and, and believe with assurance? I mean, even in these days, as you look at it, because listen, none of this stuff has caught him unawares. <laughs> Texas is not off of God's radar. <laughs> you understand what I mean? New Caney is not just a, a blip somewhere. No, listen, he has children here. And I don't know what all, I, I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture. I don't know sickness or health or whatever. I just know that nothing happens under his watch that he's not acutely aware of. And I believe that. I've been the recipient of some of that. And so have you. Well, who are the subjects of his comfort? We, we, we see that the triune God has the monopoly on it. What's the scope of it? Man, it is comfort and it is mercy and everything that falls in between. Well, then who are the subjects of his comfort? If, if, you know, if you don't know by now, I mean, some of this, what I've already said, the FBI would have called that a clue. <laughs> it's us. We're the subjects of His comfort. And do you know what? Even the Scripture says about lost people that it's the goodness of God that leadeth them to repentance. There are some men who had to acknowledge that before they got saved. Some men have wound up in prison and said, no, it's good that I wound up here that I might hear the gospel and be saved. His creation, even lost men have had to testify in the end that God has been good to them. The Lord did good in that He led men to repentance, whether they came to Him or not, whether they said yes or not, or they hardened their hearts. Men go to hell not because God rejected them. They go to hell because they have rejected God. And that's the bottom line. But His children... His children. I, I've mentioned this. Turn with me there. Go there with me. We'll be done. Look in Psalm 103. I love this particular psalm. Psalm 103. If you split your Bible in half, those of you at home, if you split your Bible in half, you should come to the book of Psalms. And then if you'll find your place in Psalm 103. And I know that this is a, this is a Jewish book, but I still believe these characteristics and attributes of God to be the same, whether written to Jew or to Gentile. I mean, look in verse 3, it says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. And I don't know about all the physical things, but I know I certainly that, the, that the disease of sin and its corruption 
He's taken care of at Calvary. Amen. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. I mean, these are all, if you're, if you're a grammar person, these are all present tense blessings. They're right now. They're not off in the past. They're not held up for the future. They are right now. Present tense. Look at verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. What we've been talking about tonight. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. That's just the goodness of God, beloved. If you know him tonight, rather than allowing you to die and go to hell, he sent someone across your path, you heard the gospel I mean, there's been, many, there's been many an indigenous person who looked up one day in, those, in that black of night and saw those stars and said, I, if you're out there, I want to know you. And God has moved heaven and earth to bring missionaries by those people so they could hear a little bit more. I mean, you think about Apollos. He only had part of the message and there was an Aquila and a Priscilla who came along and said, you know, we think we can help this, this boy. And they showed him the more perfect way. Amen. I mean, God wasn't going to leave him out there by himself. Cornelius had all those questions and all those prayers. And he did it for just one man. It wasn't all of Cornelius' Italian band. It was just a man who wanted to know him. And God did that. How much more, beloved, over one of his children that he knows by name. And that, you know, knows you. That's why Paul said, you know, he said, you know about God, but rather are known of God. Known of God. He remembers. Look, look what it says. Verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. So he considers us, he's cognizant of us, he recognizes us. These are the subjects of his comfort. It is me and you. Me and you. And so how can we appropriate these things? How can we, well some of this comes to us just by way of our walk with God in our prayer life. How he can strengthen you as you read the word of God and comfort your heart. You may have had trouble this morning. You were concerned about something and you took the time to read, open the word of God and have, have some prayer with God and he could speak to your heart and say, this is the way, walk you in it. This is the solution. man. I mean the decisions that you have to make and God can speak to your heart and say, this is the right way to go about it. Listen, he's got all the wisdom. He's got all the power. He's got the answers. All he wants is for us to go to him. How do we appropriate these things? Again, the Lord Jesus was our example. Look at how many times he went to his father. And if he went those times, how much more should we? So let me encourage you this week. Something rips or tears or breaks. Listen, God is aware of it. And he just wants you to come to him. That, that's why, you know, Brother Roger has repeated so many times here about drawing nigh to God. And, and what is his response? He will draw nigh to us. It's not that God's opposed to, to moving or helping, but sometimes the next move is not his, it's ours. Are you near to him like you once were? That's only something you can answer. Are you following from afar like Peter did? That's something only you can answer. How long has it been since you heard from him? Again, it, you have to examine your own life. I'm telling you, mercy and comfort and grace and peace are there in abundance. God's not in the rationing business. It might be that way at Walmart over toilet paper, but it's not that way over the essentials from heaven. Amen? God has not put any of us on rationing. Don't live beneath your privilege, beloved. Draw nigh to Him. Trust Him. Look to Him. 
acknowledge Him. That's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, right? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and all thy way and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy path. It was true back then. It's true today. It'll be, if the Lord tarries 50 more years, it'll be true then. He loves you. He is indeed the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. And He's our Father if you know Him. Boy, if you don't know Him tonight, tonight would be a good night to trust Him. Amen? To call upon Him and find out what a Savior is. What we know about Him. That He loves you. Sent His Son to die for you. Wants you to call upon Him and trust Him with all of your heart. Amen? Let's stand. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our God and our Father today. Thank you, Lord, for the comfort that you provide and supply, the grace and the mercy. I thank you, Lord, for our high priest tonight who knows our circumstance and situation, is well acquainted with these things, Lord, and bids us to come boldly to that throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I hope, Lord, that we would never fail in those matters and God, I thank you that you never grow weary of hearing from us. And I pray, Father, that you'll bless our people this week. And those at home, God, I pray you'll work in their hearts this week. May they draw nigh to you, knowing that you'll draw nigh to them. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.